I think about it like, you know, like when we talk about like ayahuasca, for example, like ayahuasca is the physical library that we're going into to study all of the other plants. And that's how, that's really the framework that, you know, First Nation people that are working with entheogenic tools, that's like, that's like almost like my hallucination, you could say of like, what is happening there? <laughs> the people who are, who are, who are like studying these, these energetics of nature in these different ways, right? Psychedelics are now acknowledged as bringing a major paradigm shift to our understanding of mental health and of human consciousness. But without some guidance, much can go awry. What are the psychological, somatic, and spiritual frameworks that can support us working with psychedelics? And who are the people stepping up to help guide us in this process? Join us as we discuss all this and more in Season 2 of Adventures of the Psyche. Hello friends and welcome to Adventures of the Psyche Season 2, where we explore the story of psychedelics and the frameworks being used to guide us as we work with them. Today we are meeting with Colette Condorcita, who shares how a miraculous recovery from a devastating injury taught her about the connection between mind, body, and spirit, and how that put her on a most extraordinary exploration of the subconscious and unconscious mind, where she now supports others in their own rewiring process. Thank you so much for joining us, Colette. Thanks so much. It's so great to be here. So you got into this work because of some pretty miraculous healing of your own, right? I'd love to hear the story. Yes. Well, uh, I was a lifelong athlete growing up and I really loved, you know, competitive, competitive sports. And by the time I was in ninth grade, I had been competitively wrestling and uh, in, Re in a Greco-Roman style, uh, in a Greco-Roman style team. And I had a dream that I was going to have a really serious injury, break my neck, uh, have, uh, have paralysis. And then um, on a subconscious level, I, I, I was trying to actually not compete that day. And then um, got a bit pressured into competing really by my coaches. And then, um, and then I proceeded to have a really serious spinal cord injury. I broke my neck and was completely paralyzed from the neck down. I had an out-of-body experience that was the same, you know, memory and information from the dream. And then when I came back into my body, it was this very interesting, really just this, um, you know, understanding of, of, of being in this moment. Um, and what happened was I had almost completely severed my spine. I broke my C4, C5 facets in my, in my spinal column, and they were locked side by side where, you know, my spinal cord had almost completely been severed. And had to have immediate surgery where um, it was attempted to, to, to fix the situation and had a fusion and was really in a, in a difficult and uh, a bad way for a long time. I had less than a 2% chance of ever moving again. I was in the hospital for many months uh, recovering and was on a ventilator, had a halo, lots of really difficult medical things that were going on. And what's interesting about that, that process was I, I think of as I reflect on it, there was a lot of points of my healing that were really this integration of what I love around sort of science and shamanism, you know, which is something that I really like to harp on about with my clients and with people in the psychedelic community, where you know I received all of the beautiful benefits of being in a hospital and having uh, access to you know modern medicine, and then for what, after that had sort of dissipated and the offerings of what that could do for me. Uh, were no longer there. You know, I was still paralyzed. And what I did was I started to go into very deep states of self-hypnosis and self-meditation, where I would start to really energetically align uh, my, the energy in my body. You know, for example, I remember one time just thinking, 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 feeling, okay, what does it feel like to, to squeeze my right butt cheek? Okay, what are all of the nerve tendons that are there that move down from my brain and go, you know, you know, just visualizing it, hallucinating it essentially. And then sure enough, some days later, you know, my right butt cheek is, is, is working. And so I started to systematically do this uh, through, through my time in the hospital. And then little by little, I started, you know, really quickly, um, relatively speaking, but re really quickly in the eyes of, of modern medicine, getting back function. And by the time I left the hospital, I was just starting to be able to walk again. Uh, and then, you know, proceeded to, to continue my, my process of recuperation from there. 
how did this experience lead you to being a practitioner and guiding others as they work with these medicines? It's a long story. You know, when I broke my neck, I was 14, 15 years old. And, but I'd always been really physical and I've always been obsessed with nature. I've been studying nature, wildlife, would have fantasies about, you know, when I was a little kid living in Africa, Asia, Latin America, being out in the world. And, you know, after, after I went through college, I studied international development, international relations, and really learned about what was not working on a development model. And I went out in the world, just really suddenly getting turned on to permaculture and regenerative agriculture, you know, going on 20 years ago. And, um, you know, found myself living in Australia, working with the old school permaculture masters, living in Southeast Asia, working with the indigenous people there, um, with environmental based ag training and advocacy, environmental education as a, as a tool of resistance to the Burmese junta with indigenous people from Burma, um, got involved with cannabis cultivation and, you know, regenerative agriculture and cannabis. And then, you know, and over that time was, you know, working with psychedelics in my own way. Um, kind of always connected to it, especially like in this aspect of connection connection to nature from practical land tenure, as well as sort of like the psycho-spiritual connectivity that, you know, we have when we're consciously learning about plants and the energetics of plants and plant medicines, aside from, you know, psychedelic plant medicines, which is like what people call plant medicines. No, there's so much plant medicine out there, you know, so there's so many different things. So I like to describe entheogenic tools as as sort of going into the library, it's like they're the library that we go into to study all of the different aspects of nature and consciousness. And so this is where that, that process started to really develop for me when in my youth. And about 11 years ago, um, my younger sister was, was killed by her, her partner. And um, it, you know, it was just a really traumatic and, and difficult time for my whole family. And um, we had just finished cultivating a grow in California. And I, I landed back in Colorado and I said, you know what, I don't want to be here. I want to, I want to get somewhere warm and I, I need to take some time off from any, from everything. And I wound up landing in Costa Rica and had shortly thereafter my first experience drinking ayahuasca. Very randomly, had no idea really even what it was, what I was getting myself into. Got invited by some very dear friends of mine who are very serious major herbalists on the planet and doing amazing things with um with their businesses and they'll they'll stay unnamed in this in this conversation but um but uh but yeah that experience really opened up a lot of really interesting things for me around just a continued process of of studying consciousness studying medicine um studying you know really nature and you know one of my teachers in Colombia he talks about how we're students of nature. And, and when we use these tools, this is a process of being able to study nature. And so for me, that's really been a part of this. Such a beautiful reflection to think of the plants as a library for the true nature of consciousness. I think about it like, you know, like when we talk about like ayahuasca, for example, like ayahuasca is the physical library that we're going into to study all of the other plants. And that's how that's really the framework that, you know, First Nation people that are working with entheogenic tools that's like that's like almost like my hallucination you could say of like what is happening there with people who are who are who are like studying these these energetics of nature in these different ways right because it's like you know I think what what kind of gets lost in 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 culture in the United States is that you know even like ayahuasca taitas or curanderos maestros that like you know it, 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 like they're just using ayahuasca no they're using so many different tools from the forest that they have learned ancestrally that they've had their own deep study with that they've had dietas with that they're making extracts with that they're using ayahuasca as a tool to be able to study the appropriate application of those things right so this is like this is sort of what i mean by that is that when you kind of get more and more refined in these different multi-dimensional facets of studying these different things that there can be a lot of really interesting insight and healing that's coming through for for yourself and that you can also be supportive in, in, in working with other people. Yeah, what a unique position you're in where you're getting to connect your studies, economics and ecology and agriculture and botany to your experiences with shamanism and the plants and your own psychedelic journeys and healing. Yeah, it's not so often you find someone sitting at the intersection of all these studies. I know you've been developing some of your own practices out of this. What are you working on now? What lights you up the most? So, you know, working with 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 individuals in a coaching perspective who are, again, it's like it, I work with individuals who aren't always working with psychedelics, but we're working in psychedelic spaces of the mind, right? We're working in the subconscious and the unconscious self. 
that, you know, with a little bit of practice, not even necessarily practice, you know, but, but sometimes practice, depending on the individual, that we can drop into uh, really at any given time. And so this is what this really interesting thing about when we're able to come out of what we consider the quote unquote conscious mind that we are engaging in right now to have this conversation, to have our level of intention and focus, et cetera, that we are resourcing from the unconscious and the subconscious selves all of the time. And so when we're able, and there's, and it's, it's almost like there's this interface that's happening, you know, there's, there's, there's an interesting um, sort of concept of, you know, when you first used, when you first drove a car, right, when you're first learning to drive a car, that you have to be uh, really attentive to the, you know, the, any noises or what the controls are, and maybe you feel really nervous, and you have to be, and then maybe after some years, you just can maybe even pass by an exit, because you're just like, essentially, just, okay, I'm on my phone, I can do whatever, because your brain has become accustomed to knowing exactly what it's doing, right? It's like little by little, there's there's neurological flexi flexibility, almost like a muscle, that as you're you're continuing to start learning those those spaces, it becomes um, stronger and stronger and stronger. So this is almost like a, a neurological, um, you know, I kind of I kind of visualize it as like these these bundles that kind of exist in the brain that whenever we're having a thought or a feeling or a system of relief or whatever, that it's basically flexing that that neural capacity. And so for individuals who are really wanting to create some kind of change in their life, especially using psychedelics as a way to be able to invite and change, whether it be from a traumatic issue, anxiety, depression, whatever, it becomes really interesting when, for me as a coach, when we can start focusing in, before even working with any psychedelic tools, around what exactly is the trigger? What exactly is the moment when you feel that feeling? What exactly is that sensation? Getting very particular about it, because, you know, when we, when people who are depressed, oh, I'm depressed all the time. Oh, I'm anxious all the time. Oh, it's all the, no, there's oftentimes moments that that's happening. And then there's also moments when it's not happening, even though the individual might not even see that. So we start to get really concise about when these things are happening. And then what I like to do is really train people and how to be able to direct their own neuroplasticity through different, and this is, how do we do this, right? So, you know, with psychedelics, as we know, many of us know, that they allow us to enter into a deeper neuroplastic state. And when we're children, we are in a highly neuroplastic state until around the age of nine or 10. Of course, we still have neuroplasticity we're always accessible to, but as we get older, it starts to diminish. And so what happens is that when we're children, that's when all of those patterns of belief, all of those different you know, aspects of ourself, all those different learnings, both positive and supportive, as well as not, are getting embedded on a, on a subconscious and unconscious level, right? And so this is what's this very interesting thing about using psychedelics as a tool for healing, is that when we're wanting to be able to utilize them to be able to drop into that more neuroplastic state, and, you know, for an indeterminate time, really, because the science is not there yet. And of course, every individual is divinely unique. So, um, but, so this aspect of being able to add additional supportive tools for an individual when they're on their everyday life to start driving the car off of the same neurological path that they've been using that has maybe not been supportive is, has, from my experience and also really from research going back to the 60s, has shown to be tremendously more powerful than you know, just using psychedelics alone when, when an individual is really trying to create some profound change in their life. That's such a great way of explaining it. It really creates this tangible model for me to think of my own behaviors. Like, I don't want that thing to happen. I don't want to let it happen. And then, of course, it happens. And this is the <laughs> thing, too, that when we can start to get more and more refined about when we're noticing that feeling come up, that we're not wanting to keep having that feeling, that thought, that behavior, and we're putting something there instead. So this is where these interesting, um, really self-hypnotic, uh, self-hypnotic practices that I love to arm people with. It's like, okay, go and use this in your everyday life. It's not just about you coming and working with me forever. Uh, it's about you getting empowered with the tools in your everyday life of how to stop the bully in the brain, as one of my teachers likes to say, um, and redirecting it in a more supportive way. And that is really the essence of neuroplasticity because neuroplasticity, you have to drive the train. You know, just because you're in a more neuroplastic state doesn't mean that you're actually making the changes in your life or the change in your thought patterns, right? You have to actually drive the train and do the work in that way. 
So the left part of my brain wants to know, how does 5-MeO, which you're a practitioner of, how does it work in conjunction with a technique like this or any of your other techniques to help people move through depression or anxiety or any other ailment? It's a really good question. So, you know, 5-MeO is the, is the biggest tool in creation, right? And there's, of course, different ways to use it. You know, we can use it in smaller dosages and then we can use it in a really, you know, in those larger dosages that everybody, you know, kind of focuses on with 5-MeO um, and having those big, you know, going for the big ego death experience, um, the, the, the big non-dual experience. And what's, what I think is interesting about um, working it with it in either one of those ways is that, you know, it has the ability to start to really release and to bring to the surface, not necessarily even in just the medicine experience, but in the coming time. Um, because, you know, 5-MeO oftentimes does have reactivation possibilities, and it really does work on the neurological system in a, in a, in a way that is quite different from other forms of psychedelics and other entheogenic tools. And what it does is it's, it's kind of this unfolding of these different aspects of our subconscious and our unconscious self that are really able to come to the surface. And so, you know, of course we can have this beautiful godlike experience where we're in the oneness of all existence and, and creation of nature and we're having that feeling with it. However, you know, the tool can also really bring forward a lot of different traumas, a lot of different subconscious and unconscious aspects of um, very difficult things. And it's, it, it's an unknown, you know, every time we work with psychedelic tools, it's a complete unknown about what's going to happen. And, and that's the beauty of it. And it can also sometimes be a challenge with it too. And so this is, you know, what I like to do with the tools that I teach people, as well as also doing really other states of hypnosis, playing around in a hypnotized state. It, I found it to be really, really helpful with preparation as well as integration, you know, from a preparation standpoint, um, using hypnosis really allows people to get to the juiciness of what their intentions are and to almost start to neurologically link up with how they can go right to those when they're working in a psychedelic state. This is not always the case with 5-MeO because 5-MeO is such, it's such a honestly wild card from my perspective. It's such a big wild card. It's not like working with psilocybin. It's honestly not like working with ayahuasca even, you know, where we can kind of be more in that space. Um, but, you know, still there's, there's that capacity to be able to really get aligned and to also have other techniques to be able to support any types of difficult integration processes. I've had incredibly difficult times integrating different experiences with 5-MeO, you know? So, I mean, um, there's just quite honestly, um, so there's, there's, there's this aspect of having different types of neurological support that I think is really important for people to have. Colette, so great to hear what you're doing and how you're doing it. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so great to be here. Thank you so much.